I want to welcome you to the uh, last of this year's um, Faith to Life lecture series. We've had uh, Dr. Daryl Meekins uh, with us in chapel yesterday and today, and this evening he uh, finishes out his series with us and heads back up to the cold, cold north. Um, so this year we've, uh, we've had uh, three previous speakers. We looked at a Christian perspective on sports. Um, we had Abdu Murray here helping us with um, dealing with the religious other, particularly the Islamic uh, community. And then last, Ryan Peterson was here uh, to help us think through a Christian perspective on the liberal arts. Um, and so this, in this last set, um, Daryl Meekins has been helping us with uh, cultural intelligence, CQ, is it CQ? Yeah. So we were asking, what's CQ? So it's like um, your IQ is your, your uh, intelligence quotient and your MQ is your emotional quotient. Um, so this is your cultural quotient, your ability uh, to, to navigate diverse cultures. And why that's important for us as Christians and why it's important for us, whether it's for our mission in the world uh, with sharing the gospel and leading people to Christ and planting churches or whether it's doing business. And uh, so tonight he's going to finish out his lecture series with us. Uh, Daryl Meekins is um, African, he was born in Zimbabwe, his parents were from the UK, and uh, then raised in Cape Town, and uh, he has a real um, um, life experience in terms of cultural diversity because of that, and um, has been teaching at what is now Summit University, it used to be Clark Summit Baptist Bible College and Seminary, and Thomas is with us from the seminary representing it, so we're Glad to have him with us. Uh, he's been teaching theology and missions, so practical theology. He's finishing up his dissertation that's uh, related to um, online education. And um, is, uh, I, uh, I suspect, will be more and more in demand uh, to help us as the church think through um, how we navigate cultural differences uh, in a way that celebrates them properly and, and honors the Lord. And so we're, we're glad to have him with us. He'll come and give his lecture. And uh, we are recording it, so he will lecture to us. And uh, then towards the end, uh, we'll have a time for uh, questions and answers. So let me pray, and then we'll turn time over to Daryl. Father, thank you so much for uh, the unique way in which you've created us in your image. We thank you, Lord, that in your creativity, you have made us different. And um, that you desire for us as we come to know you and to be reconciled to you, uh, to also be reconciled to one another and then to re reflect the diversity with which you've created us in ways that celebrates your goodness and your glory. And uh, we confess to you, each of us here this evening, that there is brokenness in us and that we need healing. Uh, we need your presence. We need your wisdom. Uh, and we thank you so much that you love us and that you're gracious, gracious toward us. Uh, we thank you for uh, sending uh, Daryl to us, we thank you for the lectures that he gave us yesterday and today in our chapels, and we thank you now for this evening when we can gather together uh, to reflect on what it means to be faithful uh, in this important area. So we commit our time to you with thanksgiving, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Daryl, thank you. All right, well, good evening. Um, so my story begins uh, in a multicultural environment, as uh, Dr. Ebert said. My parents were originally from London, England, uh, moved to Rhodesia, which was the last uh, remaining British colony in Africa at the time. And uh, for no uh, God-glorifying reasons at all, my parents were not missionaries, <laughs> um, they wanted to uh, seek the sun and get away from uh, the gloomy London weather, amongst other things, and so that is why they relocated there. So I was born in Rhodesia. My sister was actually born in Wales in the UK. And when uh, the government uh, in 
what is now Zimbabwe began to change hands. Things were not uh, so easy for British nationals remaining in the country at the time. And so they made a decision to relocate to South Africa, which I'm very grateful for, as I got to be raised in one of the most beautiful cities in the world, which is uh, Cape Town. Uh, so my story, even from the very beginning, was immersed in a little bit of multiculturalism. Uh, my best friend as a child uh, was a Muslim, which made things a little complex because in addition to my dad and mom being from England, my dad was Jewish and my mom was Anglican, so the idea of their son being friends with a Muslim probably wasn't high on their agenda. And so that introduced me a little bit to what it was like to be friends with people who not only were different culturally, but also had different religious beliefs. Um, and then a little bit later in my life, I uh, became good friends with some US American missionaries. And uh, to this day, some of them remain my closest friends and very much appreciate the influence that they've had on my life. And uh, just after that, a few years later, I met my wife, who is uh, from South Jersey, uh, which is a different state than <laughs> North Jersey, um, uh, or so they say. And so she says, anyway. And so uh, I've had the opportunity for the last almost 10 years that we've been married, uh, and with, along with our three uh, little girls, Emma, Elise, and Ella, uh, to learn what it's like to be in a multicultural family as well. So that is just my personal background. And in addition to that, I've, I've grown in my interest over the last couple of years, especially as to uh, how culture is just very much a part of who we are. And appreciating that diversity is very important. So as we start tonight, I, I want to say that, first of all, this is, I guess, the third part of a three-part series, but it also is very much a standalone section. So if you haven't uh, heard of any of the uh, other sessions, that's not a problem. We'll certainly uh, give you enough content that you'll uh, be able to understand exactly what we're doing. Tonight, I really want to focus on why uh, cultural intelligence, CQ, is an important component of our understanding, especially if we're going to <coughs> succeed in the world in which we live, uh, regardless of your vocational choice, but especially in the world of, of business uh, that we see around us. So before we get into that, I want to show you a brief clip. Uh, you may have seen this before, but it kind of explains where CQ originated from. Are you culturally intelligent? That's the question. Ken Robinson, some of you might have heard of him, uh, he once said, it's very hard to know, by the way, uh, what it is you take for granted. And the reason is that you take it for granted. We have these biases that are intrinsic to who we are as people. We have these blind spots. And so right off the bat, it's important for us to realize that this cultural diversity issue, uh, if for no other reason, is important for us to grow as individuals and as people to realize other people don't see the same, the world the same way that we do. And that is actually sometimes a beautiful thing. For those in the Christian community, um, we sometimes would look at the scriptures that we hold so dear and we say, well, we may have all this diversity, but you know, we all look at this, the scriptures the same way. We all have the same Bible. So if nothing else, uh, you know, we should look at the text and say, we have this Bible, we all see it the same way. Uh, just a very interesting quick exercise, we could spend a long time talking about this, but there was a New Testament professor several years ago who did an experiment with 
how we look at the Bible and how very often we tend to overlook things that are not part of our cultural uh, proclivities. You might be aware of the study. But very simply, <clears throat> he asked this question. Why did the prodigal son, you know the story of prodigal son, Luke 15, right? Uh, you probably are familiar with that story. It's very well known in the Bible, even if you're not a Christian. What was, why was the prodigal in the pig pen? That was a very simple question that he asked. And what he began to do with that was he asked different cultural groups around the world this very same question. They would say, well, it's easy, right? What's the answer to that question? Why did the prodigal end up in the pig pen? And the answer is... Well, he squandered his wealth, right? That's what most of us would say. Uh, he spent all his money and uh, he, he, he wasted it all. He took his inheritance and he wasted it and that's why he ended up in the pig pen. Well, very interestingly, as this question was asked in Eastern Europe and also in Tanzania, Africa and in the US, three different responses emerged. The one that most of us here in the US would have defaulted to was the one that most people did. He squandered his wealth. Uh, for those in Eastern Europe, they pointed to the fact that there was a famine that arose in the land and that caused him to be in need. And then thirdly, the Tanzanians looked at that and said the problem was no one gave him anything to eat. So this begs the question, which culture is right? Which people are right? Well, if you look at the text itself, very interestingly, all three responses are there. Everybody's right. And yet, because of our cultural background, we tend to zone in and focus in on one over the other. Because here in Anglo culture, in very uh, Western individualized culture, we tend to read the Bible as though we're the only one it was written to. We tend to look at things and say, well, of course this happened because we live in a cause and result sort of society. But the Tanzanians, for example, who live in a very collectivistic culture, would say it is our responsibility to care for all of us, regardless of the individual decisions that are made. So when they read the scriptures and they see things like no one gave him anything to eat, that stands out to them much more than he squandered his wealth individually. So all that to say is that we need to examine how we look at life and how we even look at the text in perhaps new lenses. So today what I want us to do is look at briefly, very, uh, very briefly, three things. We're going to look at mapping some of those cultural differences. I want to give you some examples of how that works. And I want to talk to you about what cultural intelligence actually is. And for free, I'm going to throw in some ways in which you can improve your own cultural intelligence. And then thirdly, how do you use CQ in your world? In fact, how is the world already utilizing the skill? I'll give you some examples from the business world uh, to illustrate that point. F first off, though, to, to consider some important statistics for us here in the U.S. There's three very important statistics I want to hone in on. The first one is significant. Because of the number that it represents, it's actually slightly higher than that. Now the statistic was taken from 2011. But that number, 51 million, uh, the number of Hispanics that now reside in the U.S., that's a significant number because 50 million is the number of people that today reside in the country of Spain. So the United States of America has more Hispanic-speaking pe people than the country of Spain. In addition to that, we see the last statistic there that one in two people that are born and, 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 and are now young children in the US are children of color, children of minorities. And therefore, that should say to us, if nothing else, that we need to realize that our cultural demographic is changing. When we look at the business world, some interesting statistics emerge. The International Labor Union points to the fact that 70%, that is the number of international ventures that fail due to cultural differences. And when you consider the amount of money that multinational corporations put into sending expatriates overseas to lead their companies and to become CEOs of those companies in Hong Kong, and China, etc., huge amounts of money gets invested in that. 70% of those ventures fail because they just cannot navigate the culture and that's a huge problem. Something else that has emerged that's, that's made this field even more interesting is that they've realized that diversity actually leads to greater innovation. The more diverse your team is, some studies have indicated, the more likely your team is to be innovative. And I don't need to tell you that innovation is what it's all about when it comes to companies succeeding or failing in the world today.
So it's probably no surprise, or it shouldn't be any surprise to us, that companies like Google and Facebook have embraced the idea of diversity and of, of innovation at the same time. And of course, Google and Facebook seem to be doing fairly well these days. Some other statistics for you. 90% of leading executives from 68 countries have said uh, that, that finding effective cross-cultural personnel is a top management challenge. When they were surveyed and asked, what is the biggest problem that you face going forward as executives, as companies, 90%, 9 out of 10 of them are saying, our biggest problem is to navigate these global, multicultural societies in which we now reside. We just don't have people who have the skill set necessary to navigate these waters. But here's the good news. Unlike your IQ, sorry, you can't do anything about that. Okay, you can play Sudoku if you want, but... Research has proven that everyone can improve their CQ. So that's good news. So even if you find yourself at a very low score, you know, if your IQ is 120 good for you, or if your CQ is 80, uh, we can help you improve that. And that's, that's good news for a lot of us. So what do we mean when we talk about CQ? Well, very simply defined, uh, cultural intelligence, or your CQ quotient, is your ability, your capability, to function effectively across various cultural contexts. Those are national contexts, one country to another, ethnic context, one grouping, cultural grouping to another, as well as organizational and generational context. So the culture of, uh, of Clearwater Christian College is different to the culture of uh, BBC or different to the culture of Yale and Harvard, etc. And so what does that corporate culture look like? If you've ever uh, studied uh, sociology or anthropology at all, you probably would have come across different diagnostics that are used to diagnose people's cross-cultural capabilities. Uh, why is CQ different from that? Well, there's four quick things I want to point to that make CQ a little bit unique from some of those diagnostic tools. Firstly, the coherent framework that it follows makes it easy for people to assess and see where they are on the scale. Uh, and a lot of diagnostic tools, they rely a lot upon anecdotes. This is how you deal with these types of people when you go to this kind of country. It's very anecdotal and doesn't have a lot of academic validity to it, which is what CQ does. Over 70 reviewed, peer-reviewed articles and numerous books have been written using this diagnostic and validating this diagnostic. It also helps to predict performance because when you know where you stand, you know what you need to do. That's the starting point. It's one thing to say, well, I've traveled around the world and I've kind of picked up some things along the way. Well, that's good and all, but how do we know that those interpretive experiences are accurate in any way? And that sometimes uh, is a problem. And then fourthly, it's a developmental approach. As I said, it's not designed to say, well, this is your score, this is where you're at, there's nothing you can do about it. It's designed to say, here's where you're at, Here's how we can get you to where you need to be. So when CQ looks at trying to diagnose that for you, we look at four capabilities, four interrelated and interconnected capabilities. And those are your drive, uh, your uh, knowledge, your strategy, and your action. These four interrelated capabilities are assessed individually to help you see where you need to improve. And along the way, before we get, we'll get back to this in a few moments, but part of understanding our CQ is understanding where we find ourselves. Um, anthropologists and, and cultural anthropologists and sociologists over the years have uh, compiled what we call today the global clusters, which talk about the various value systems that these global clusters have. Uh, Gert Hofstede was uh, one of the preeminent forerunners in this field, but since then there have been numerous others who have affirmed and ratified his teachings about global clusters. So what are these global clusters? Around the world we have roughly 10 different global clusters. Whenever people look, like a, uh, look at a diagram like this, one of the first things that people say is, well, you know, that's a huge amount of people you're putting into Latin America. You know, that's, that's a fairly generic and, and general uh, statement that you might be making about those people. And that is true, right? In every audience, you're going to find people that are going to say, well, that's how you're saying these people are, but I'm not like that. Okay, so when you are trying to give general characteristics of millions, tens of millions of people, there are going to be exceptions. So when we look at these global clusters, we are certainly not saying everyone in the society is like this. 
all we're simply saying is that a lot of people generally would find themselves in these categories. And so when somebody uh, undertakes a diagnostic to examine where they find themselves in these global clusters, uh, what gets given to you is your analysis as compared to how those look. So if you can, if you have really good vision, you can see those little triangles underneath there, okay? So when you look at those 10 global clusters, what you see in that little triangle is where you fit in. And that's extremely useful for a couple of reasons. One of the obvious reasons why that is useful is because you can begin to compare yourself over against where your culture generally finds itself. And this is very useful, especially in corporate culture. So if, uh, if the, the folks here at Clearwater decide we wanted to do a corporate analysis of our culture here at Clearwater, okay, and we found that uh, a few of the people on the executive team were very collectivistic in nature, but the vast majority were very individualistic in nature. That gives us a good platform then to begin saying, all right, so this is why these people, these two people over here, this is why we always think they're a little strange at meetings, right? This is why we kind of scratch our head when they walk out of the room, because we're like, why, why is this guy not on the same page as us, you know? And maybe that's because they think differently than the rest of you. Uh, that's a very useful tool for a leader of that team to have in their arsenal. So, uh, as you can see, you can see the, the cluster, and then you eventually get to see your own score in that cluster, um, which I say is very helpful. So what are some of these? I want to talk through them very, very briefly, and I'm just going to talk through some of them with you. First of all, we have uh, individualism versus collectivism. These are one of the cultural values that we see around the world. It's a continuum, okay? So there are two extremes on that continuum, and a lot of people reside in between those two extremes. Well, can you guess where Anglos generally tend to find themselves? Individualism. There we go, right? We tend to be more individualistic. We tend to be focused more on ourselves. We teach our children to stand up for themselves. We teach our children to communicate clearly for themselves. In the classroom, we focus on individual scores and individual attainment, who gets the gold medal, those types of things. In collectivistic cultures, the question is not so much, how did I do? The question is, how are we doing? And so when you find yourself in that type of, of differential your ability to succeed in that moment is going to come down to your understanding who you are and your understanding who those people are as well. So this is true of a corporate culture as well as ethnic and national cultures too. So here's, here's the for free part. So what do you do if you find yourself in those types of environments? Well, if you are dealing with individualists, what you need to be able to do is, is allow for that autonomy to exist. So this is very practical for me because <clears throat> as I teach in a very Western context, I've had to adjust my teaching style um, quite a bit over the last couple of years. It's been a good learning experience for me. And to allow for people to have greater autonomy, to allow for people to do things individually, when my proclivity is to allow the team to work together towards a solution. But I very quickly found out that students would kind of raise their hands or email me or send me nasty text messages. No, they didn't do that. They wanted to, but they didn't. Um, one of my students is here, Megan's here, so she didn't do that. Um, so what I found very quickly was that people wanted to work on their own. They wanted to come to their own conclusions. They wanted to make their own decisions. So allow for that autonomy. If you're working with collectivists, create time for consultation and consensus building. Again, imagine if you were doing a corporate study and, and the, the, the leader of the organization and all the executive team take the diagnostic test and the results come back. And the leader of the team turns out he is hyper-individualistic. But his executive team is hyper-collectivistic. What does he now need to be able to do? He's probably walked out of meetings time after time thinking, what's wrong with these people? Why don't they want to you know, just get the job done. Why can't they just do what I tell them to do individually when I tell them to do it? Now he is armed with information that makes him say, I need to take the time to build consensus among my team. I need to value the relationship above the task. Very, very helpful to know that. Another one is power distance. This is a very interesting one. Can you guess 
where people in Anglo cultures tend to find themselves most often. Yeah, we tend, we tend to find ourselves very much in the low power distance, right? Uh, we de-emphasize structures. Students in classrooms feel the utmost freedom to talk to or disagree with their teachers, right? Uh, I'm going to disagree with this. I'm going to say, I, I don't think that's right. They may do it in a respectful way, but we believe that it's important for individuals to be able to express their uh, viewpoints in organizations, even though they are hierarchies. We don't, we don't look at it in the West generally as those hierarchies being untouchable places where it can be. Um, the janitor can talk to the CEO, all right? He may not be respected by the CEO, but he will feel like he has the right to say something. That is not true in countries and in places where there are very specific hierarchical structures that you do not go across. You never challenge the teacher. You nod, you smile, you take copious notes. That's what you do. And you certainly, if you're going to challenge them, you can do it mentally, but you cannot do it out loud and you cannot do it publicly. So that helps us to realize if we're in that stance, if we're in that phase, to think about, well, how do we deal with people who are low power distance? Well, obviously, we ought to de-emphasize those formalities. When we know that we're dealing in a culture where people feel the freedom to exchange their ideas in an individualistic way, we need to, need to make the path clear for them to do that, allow them to question and even challenge authority. In high power distance cultures, it's important for us to follow that chain of command very, very carefully. Because we perhaps are raised in a culture where you know, we don't see that hierarchy, we might tend, if we're in a foreign country like China or Japan, which does tend to follow these structures more rigidly, that we'd say, oh yeah, there's the you know, CEO of that company that we're going to work. I'm just going to go over and say hi and ask him a couple of questions about the merger that's about to happen. When you're not the CEO, you're just the guy carrying the bags. All right? You don't get to have that conversation with them, and it's important that you realize that. You should talk to the other bag handler instead. Cooperative versus competitive. Well, guess where we are. We like the win, right? I want to compete. Whereas other cultures, that is not nearly as important. It is about the we. It is about the us. Now again, imagine if you find yourself in a corporate setting where you receive the diagnostic tools back and you realize that I am a highly competitive individual as the leader of this team, but the rest of my executive team, they are highly cooperative people. For me, it is about winning. It is about the task first. Guys, this is our agenda. This is what we need to get through today. When the rest of my team, they tend to get fatigued by that. They don't like that idea. They tend to want to default and, and defer a lot of decisions. That frustrates me and that frustrates them. So how do I fix that? If you're dealing with cooperative people, it's important that you establish the relationship before the task. Establish a relationship before the task. Communicate very clearly to build rapport. It, it's interesting to me right now as I uh, engage in my PhD studies, uh, I often talk to my professor over Skype and we have some good conversations. <coughs> The conversations never last more than about 20 minutes and about 15 of those 20 minutes he spends asking me about my family and about my life and how things are going and is it still snowing near Philadelphia and all those kinds of things. And the last five minutes he says, here are the real issues I had with your dissertation chapter. Because for him and for people like him, the relationship is much more important than the task. So we need to be aware of that. Context. High context versus low context. Well, the diagram kind of says it all, doesn't it? When we're dealing with people who believe in a low context, that means that we focus on dealing with the issue explicitly. We deal with talking about it plainly, as some people might say. I just like to say it like it is, right? You ever hear someone say that? Okay. Oh, yeah. I just like to talk very plainly about it and say it like it is. So if I have a problem with you, you're going to know about it, all right? Maybe everyone else can hear me shouting too, but you're going to know about it. I'm, I'm quite happy to tell you that. So we have a very low context in the West. But again, other cultures, and indeed probably most cultures, if we're talking in terms of population size around the world, they don't think that way. 
They have a high cultural context, which means that the issue is not explicitly dealt with, but rather in the context of communicating, you're supposed to pick that up. Okay? So, again, picture yourself around the boardroom table, all right, and Johnny has not been performing the way that he is supposed to be this quarter. He has not brought in the sales the way that he should. So the executive team looks at Johnny and they say, Johnny, we are very disappointed in your performance. Right? What, oh, we think you're lazy, you're coming in late, uh, you're leaving early, and you're not performing. Right? That's a fairly typical conversation that might happen in the Western context. In the non-Western context, Johnny's sitting there along with the rest of the team, and the conversation might go something like this. There are some people amongst us who appear to not always be able to perform the way in which some other people are. It appears as though Perhaps if we were to change the times in which we came and left for work, it may be possible for some of us to improve our performances. Now Johnny's sitting there and everyone else is sitting there and looking at the same information and Johnny's getting the point. Oh, I'm bottom of the list. But he was not explicitly called out on that. He was not embarrassed. He was not shamed. And so the conversation takes on a slightly different tone. So to be aware of that is very important understand and recognize the importance of reflecting and pay careful attention to what is not being said dealing with high context communicators. Pay attention to the story that is being told even if you're thinking to yourself what in the world does this have to do with our meeting right now? Probably it has everything to do with it. And one final one, being versus doing. Again, where do you think Anglos and Westerners tend to fit? We like to do, right? One of the first questions we ask in a gathering such as this, hi, my name is so-and-so, what do you do? Because we define ourselves very often by what we do, right? This is my job, this is what I do. For people who are more being oriented, that is a less important question. Not that it's completely unimportant, but I want to know how you are. And I want to know who you are. And perhaps along the way I might find out what you do, but that's not the first question I ask and that's not the thing that I care about the most. So if you're dealing with people who are more being orientated, affirm who that person is, not just their performance, not just the role that they play, and to manage that relationship in an authentic manner. But if you're dealing with doing individuals, you affirm the accomplishments and the new opportunities and you manage the process rather than the relationship. And there are others that are measured on the scale that if you were to take the CQ diagnostic test, you will get a firm score on where you land in each one of those proclivities, which can be immensely helpful to you as an individual to find out where you are. But also, if you're taking it in the context of a team or a mission group or a church group or a business, it can really help you to figure out where you are in the context to where your other teammates are. So back to the CQ quadrants for a moment. How do we begin to grow and, and measure our idea of what does it mean to grow in our CQ, drive, knowledge, strategy, and action. Let's focus in on drive for a moment. How do you look at your CQ drive? Well, there are a few different sub-elements to that. The first thing is your intrinsic interest. Your willingness to just do something. What would make people uh, go bog diving. I don't know. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me why somebody would splash around in the mud. But there's a drive there. There's an interest there. People want to do it and so they just get it done somehow. So there's an intrinsic interest there. If you want to grow in CQ, chances are you probably will, right? Because you have an interest to do it. There's also what we might call the extrinsic interest which is the, you know, the carrot dangling before you. It's something that is, is there because of maybe some employment contractual issues that are there. Um, but there are outside factors that are causing you to explore this area. But then thirdly, we look at your self-efficacy, which is your ability to succeed and what that does for you as an individual. And there's different strategies that you can use to enhance your intrinsic, extrinsic, and self-efficacy elements of your CQ drive, which we don't have time to get into. But that's what we want to look at. We want to look at how, how much do I feel that I'm capable to actually do this, and what are some things that I can do about it. 
What about when it comes to knowledge? Very often when people travel overseas, they come back acting as though they are the world's expert on that country that they spent two weeks in, right? You, you ever had that experience where you say, oh, how was your trip to Bolivia? Oh, it was great. You know, the people there, they like to do this, they like to do that. This is what they do for a living. This is the GDP of the country. And you're thinking, man, you know, how did you become an expert in this country all of a sudden? And the truth is, they're not. They may just think that they are. But knowledge is a very important piece of the puzzle because we've got to go beyond just the tourism aspect to say, well, how do these people actually function and how is it different from the way I function? For example, there was a survey done a few years ago um, asking people in different countries around the world, especially those that are involved in doing youth work, what do adolescents fear the most was the question that they were asked. And again, much like the prodigal son question, the answers were very, very different. In the West, rejection by their peers was seen as the number one thing that, that teenagers fear the most, being rejected uh, by their peers. For others in Singapore and out further in the Far East, their parents' death or academic failure was the number one thing that they feared the most. Now this is very important information for you to have as an individual if you plan to work with youth in those types of contexts. The danger is that we presume that they're like me and that they're like us. So if our teenagers tend to fear this, then that must be true of all teenagers, all places, at all times. And it simply isn't true. People are different. Think about sociolinguistics. I'm speaking English to you right now. <coughs> I'm speaking proper English to you right now. I'm speaking the Queen's English to you right now. You sitting out there, you speak a different brand of English. Uh, a corruption of the English language, if you will. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. It is a different kind of English, right? So even in this room where we would all say we are English speakers, not all English speakers speak the same English. So understanding that and the words that different people may use for things is very important. I'll give you just one example of that. In South Africa and in other countries that are of British origin, the uh, little thing that you put into a baby's mouth when they're making a noise, we call a pacifier. Okay? Had to think for a moment there, didn't you? Okay. Uh, we call it a dummy. Okay, so uh, you would often find people that come from the U.S. and they'd be around little babies and someone would say, hey, put the dummy in the kid's mouth. <laughs> and you get this, like, that's, first of all, like, who are you calling dummy and why would you put them in the kid's mouth? That just doesn't make sense at all. And of course it doesn't unless you understand the sociolinguistic rationale. What about leadership? Are all leaders made the same? Does leadership always look the same? Uh, this is a, a, an interest of mine. I enjoy thinking and talking about leadership. And again, very often in Christian circles, people will say, a biblical leader, a Christian leader, looks like this. And my question to them very often is, according to whom? Your interpretation, most likely, but it's not always the same in every case. And so even how we lead would look different. The leader is not always look and sound the same way that they do in the Western world. So these knowledge pieces are very important for us to add to our arsenal. And then comes the idea of strategy. What is going to be my strategy for dealing with these cross-cultural, intercultural circumstances? How am I going to plan to be efficient in this particular area? That includes, obviously, your planning for these cross-cultural situations. It also includes your ability to be aware of what is going on around you at the time. To stop, think, and ask good questions about what's going on. And then to check your assumptions and adjusting your mental maps when experiences differ from expectations. So there are some things that you can do to improve that. And one of the most important of those things is the first thing there. Notice, but don't respond. We tend to want to see something and act. Maybe that's our individualistic culture coming to the fore, right? We see, we want to act. But instead, we need to train ourselves to say, I'm going to notice, I'm going to take it on board, and I'm going to reflect on it. But I'm not going to respond because there's probably something going on here that I don't understand. And my incorrect response at this moment in time 
could cause the deal to collapse, it could cause the conversation to change, and it may cause the person to want to leave the conversation, which I don't want. And then finally, our action. We could have some fun with this one, but your action is your ability to, on the fly, be able to relate in a way that is proper in the circumstance. Sometimes that involves adjusting your verbal behaviors. Your accent and your tone might need to change slightly from what you're used to. Um, my wife and I often have this competition whenever we fly somewhere, and we call it Spot the American. <laughs> I usually do it with my eyes closed, because you can hear them before you see them. And uh, some of that means that we need to be aware of our own cultural proclivities and be willing to adjust those when it could be terminally offensive to the culture that we're going to. In some cultures, being loud okay, is seen as a very disrespectful thing. And that's not something that a person is doing to be disrespectful. They just talk loud. But our inability to adjust our behavior shows that we have very poor CQ action because we're not willing to make the adjustment or we're ignorant to make the adjustment that is necessary. Also to be aware of your non-verbal communication. Your gestures, the things that you would say that could, or the things that you don't say that could even be offensive to somebody without even opening your mouth. Um, we don't have time to go into it, but you can look it up on YouTube. There's a number of good clips that you can look at that talk about how simple hand gestures that we often use in everyday life in the Western world mean something completely different in another culture. All right? Um, so we need to be aware of those because we might make a signal to somebody that we think means one thing, it actually means something very different, and we don't want to do that. Even our facial expressions. Um, some cultures are very expressive in terms of what they do with their face, how they smile, how expressive they are with that. Other cultures um, tend to see that as a, either a sign of weakness or disrespect. If somebody smiles too broadly, for example, some cultures that is seen as you thinking that they are stupid if you smile at them too broadly. So just by being friendly, you can offend someone, okay? So this is why it's important for us uh, to be aware of that. So what does CQ do for you? Well, in closing, I want to just share with you some of the, the, the benefits that we've seen of CQ around the world. Well, CQ has been proven to improve cross-border performance, judgment and decision-making, creativity and innovation, and the ability to expand into new markets, and has uh, been able to deal with the fatigue and burnout rate that happens from the lack of success in dealing with other cultures. So there's a number of positive spin-offs from somebody who is culturally intelligent. Profitability, of course, being one of those, but job performance and well-being, knowing that I'm here in a place and I'm doing something that I have been able to learn how to do and function effectively in, even though it's not my natural waters, is a very fulfilling thing indeed. So who's using this stuff? Who's gaining from this? I wish I could say that all the churches and non-profit Christian organizations around the country and around the world are using this. But the reality is that's not the case. The people that are most using this skill right now is the business world. And I want to give you some examples of that. Organizations like Coca-Cola have integrated cultural intelligence as a key part of driving new business initiatives. All of their top executives have to receive their training and have to be diagnosed with a diagnostic before they can uh, take international um, posts. Google, as I mentioned earlier, Google uses CQ to assess and train recruiters to find high-achieving individuals around the world, those that are willing to work in cooperative environments that is going to lead to greater innovation. Organizations like Merrill Lynch and Bank of America have used cultural intelligence to improve the merger that occur between those two organizations, cultural intelligence in the corporate world. Companies uh, like Medtronic uh, have used the CQ to improve the effectiveness completion of global projects. BMW has used CQ uh, to leverage the potential of cultural diversity. 
McDonald's and IBM have used CQ to prepare executives for overseas environments. And airlines like Lufthansa and Saudi Arabian Airlines have used that to drive sales and service. And most recently, uh, Harvard has required all of their MBA students to be uh, given CQ diagnostic tests before they are allowed to complete their MBA degrees. You cannot complete your MD MBA degree at Harvard University if you have not received your CQ diagnostic. So those are just a few of the things that is happening around the world that I think speak to this importance of CQ. And I wish that we in the Christian environment, the Christian world, were taking this a little more seriously than we do. There's some great resources that are available when you think about CQ. There's some great books. Um, Serving with Eyes Wide Open, especially for Christian mission, is very important. Cultural Intelligence, written by Dave Livermore, really goes into more detail of some of the cultural values that I've mentioned very briefly tonight. Um, you can go to culturalq.com, which uh, gives you a lot of the explanation of the history of the CQ Center and its founder uh, and president, David Livermore. And of course, if uh, you're interested in how you can uh, access the diagnostics, how you can take the test, what does that look like, how much does it cost, all the rest of that, you can drop me an email and I'd be more than happy to talk you through uh, some of that. So that is a, a very brief introduction to why CQ matters for the academy and for the marketplace. And I hope that uh, you can grow in your own CQ drive uh, intelligence as we go through it. can be improved. So, it's important for you to think through that. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Well, now we're going to have um, an opportunity to be two-way with the discussion here. Um, because of our size and the nature of our group, we'll do it kind of the old-fashioned way where you raise your hand, we say go, you ask a question. Questions may be answered, maybe you're happy, maybe you're not. We all go home, we could. But first, uh, I wrote down some questions, so in the name of getting us started, and because I'm the one up here, I want to start with my own questions. Um, it's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Very individualistic, by the way. It is, yes. All about you. yes. <laughs> <coughs> but now I know. Yeah. Um, to the question, or to Frank's point at least. Yeah. We saw some of the imperatives or motivations for increasing our CQ, for getting better at it. Um, a theologian we might all be familiar with, um, D.A. Carson, has said, uh, ignorance may be bliss, but it's not a virtue. Mm -hmm. And so I want to ask, um, beyond profitability or well-being, is there a moral or perhaps theological imperative to increasing our cultural intelligence? Yeah, and I think um, if you're you know, in the session on Thursday, we kind of spoke about that a little bit, but I think that that is, um, if we're thinking biblically and theologically, um, I think first of all we need to acknowledge that our God is a God of diversity. So as human beings, we are made in the image of God, in the Imago Dei, and the diversity that we see around us today, I believe, uh, is not a result of, of judgment, as some would say, um, but I think it's part of God's design to culminate the story that we find in Revelation of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Um, coming to the throne and worshiping God is a part of that multicultural culmination of the mission of God. Uh, so I think it's, it's deeply rooted in theology, which is why, you know, as I alluded to a few moments ago, um, for me personally, it's, it's sad sometimes when we don't see the church as a whole, the expression of the church, um, really grappling with this as much as we ought to because like you say the business world they look at profitability first of all yes they, 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 and it's not fair to say it's only profitability I mean there are businesses that are very concerned about um, being um, good people and good good businesses um, but we should be far more concerned than they because we have we have a, a missional imperative so a lack of cultural intelligence. Just to press the question further. Mm -hmm. Poor form or sinful? <laughs> or where in, the, where in there do we, do we learn? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah, back to your point. I mean, ignorance is, is bliss. So uh, now nobody in this room can say they're ignorant. Um, so now, you know, it, it depends what you do when you walk out the doors. 
Um, if you walk out <coughs> saying, well, that was stupid, um, I don't care about that, then that probably is at some level uh, sinful because you, you are, what are you saying by that? You're saying that uh, diversity is not God's design, you're saying it doesn't matter, you're saying that you know everything you need to know. Well, there's probably some arrogance or ignorance or a combination <coughs> in that statement. So, um, but, you know, um, I think a lot of times we are simply ignorant and therefore <coughs> the solution is to, to be schooled on it a little bit. Good. Um, another question, and I will expose my both competitiveness and uh, desire to do. Yes. Um, the scales, the spectrums we talked about, you, you showed to us, are descriptive. Are there parts of them which we, at least as Christians, should see as prescriptive or, or ways in which we should be? Um, there's two tendencies here, and I, and I think I think I grew up, I came after a generation, so probably those of us in here who are students or, or closer in range, we grew up with parents who um, would have seen the way we do things here as a country largely as the right way. <clears throat> My generation has come along and pendulum swung the other way, where if we do it as Americans, it's something we only saturize and then we want to go and do whatever these things are. So if you go to our coffee shops, you see things that are Eastern, or you'll see things that are um, <coughs> even African, even in decor, and these kind of things. Okay. And we want to do the opposite thing, whichever it is, Okay, you know, whether it be collective or individualistic, or those kind of things. Okay. Is there a biblical way on any of these issues? Or are they biblically neutral? Or how do, how do we think through those things? Yeah, so you're talking about the continuums, the pendulums, mm -hmm. individualism versus collectivism. And any of them? Yeah, any, any okay. of those, yeah. Um, Hmm. Uh, it's an interesting question. I think, first of all, um, yeah, I mean, the way in which those categories have been put together have been put together predominantly by social scientists and cultural anthropologists, not theologians. Um, so this is not sort of, well, the Bible says, okay, that doesn't, for me, it doesn't mean that it doesn't matter, but um, that's the first thing. I guess I would say that um, if you look at the context in which the Bible was written, um, particularly the First Testament, and particularly as you look at the life of someone like Paul, um, they were far different than our Western culture is today as individuals. So if we were to say, uh, who, who were they? What were they like? They would probably be, you know, uh, collectivistic. They would be high power distant. You know, there'd be all of those things that, that we tend not to be, generally speaking. However, that begs the question, so are we saying that that's what we should be? And I don't think so, because I think um, the diversity piece is just that. Um, I don't think being individualistic is bad. I don't think being collectivistic is bad. I think being individualistic is good. I don't think being collectivistic is good. I think it just is. It's a bit like personality. Um, the, the difference is, is when we begin to say, and this is where ethnocentrism creeps in, is when we begin to say, you should be this way too. You know, what's wrong with you people? Uh, why aren't you more like this? Um, so that's when we begin to create cultures that are unhealthy, is when we try to force our proclivities on somebody else. And yet probably the ideal is somewhere in the middle, that we are able to, to understand individualism and collectivism in its best and brightest parts. Um, I think that would probably be, you know, in the perfect world, which we'll one day experience. Um, then that's probably what it'll be. But for right now, we have, you know, see through the blast arc. We talk a lot about uh, intellectual integrity, specifically in our context, often um, as it relates to um, history. We need to look back and see the people as they were in their community and not try to put our context in their world and judge their actions, whether it be people in our own country, um, however many years ago, or be people in the ancient world, et cetera. Is there a sense in which that's part of cultural intelligence? Hmm. Um, can you give me an example? What you mean by that? Yes. Um, it's what C.S. Lewis would have called chronological snobbery. Okay. Looking back and, and judging people's actions in the past by today's standards. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we spend a lot of time today looking back and saying, 
we never should have done those things. Some of that's hindsight 20. And some of that is hindsight's 2020. Mm -hmm. Others is saying because of what we're sensitive today, looking back on past actions, and I, you can imagine mm -hmm. any number of them sure. from colonial days on yeah. things we would have done. Women voting, for instance. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, those that was a mistake. No, I'm right. just kidding. you're alive. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, mm, I don't know. I think, uh, if I understand correctly your question, I, I think that speaks to um, our ability to um, correctly interpret, because history is always interpretive. You know, um, whoever, whoever wins the war gets to write the history. <laughs> you know, so, um, so I think, you know, the more we understand about that and the more in which our story gets formed as time goes by, we, we tend to look back at these things a little bit differently, and I think that's okay. Um, the degree to which cultural intelligence informs that, that process, I suppose um, it would inform it from the standpoint of um, <coughs> how we look at the decisions that were made. Um, you know, if we just if we just think in the recent past, I'll give you a personal example. You know, um, when just 25 years ago, in fact, the university that I'm now studying through through my PhD work was the preeminent university that informed the state of South Africa as to why apartheid, which is the separation of peoples, was a biblical, godly thing to do. Right. They wrote article after article, book after book, to say this is, the, you know, according to strict Calvinist tradition, you know, these people are not chosen. And secondly, um, we are the new Israel. And because we are Israel, we should do what Israel in the Old Testament did and drive out all the foreign nations from among us. And this was a rhetoric, it was a theology, it was affirmed, it was preached. And so by and large, the people who were governing the state said, hey, we're doing God's work here. You know, yes, sure, it gets a little bit messy and we commit gross human rights violations, but, you know, uh, it's for the greater good. Um, so, as a society, looking back on that 25 years later now, I think that the cultural intelligence piece for me would be to say, what was really going on then? Um, did the people at the time see that? Did the people who, during the rise of the Third Reich, see what was going to happen in Nazi Germany? Probably not. But through the lens of history, we can look back and, and see uh, some of the things that were going on that, that they probably couldn't have seen. So um, how we interpret that, however, is, is very much down to more than just cultural intelligence. It's our, it's our theology, it's our proclivities, it's our biases. Yeah, very good. That makes sense. No, I think so. I think it does. All right. Uh, those of us who are not on the stage, if you have questions. <laughs> the collective hall. Yeah, the collective hall. Um, any questions for? Mr. Meekins. I was, as I was listening to your definition or your explanation of cultural intelligence, I was trying to relate it to some overlapping or similar kind of analysis. For example, with Myers-Briggs mm -hmm. um, work styles. Mm -hmm. um, and in some, of the, some of the conclusions are almost similar, in other words, you do a work styles analysis, mm -hmm. or you do the Myers-Briggs temperament analysis, and you know, I find out I'm more individualistic, and my and you know, my wife is more collective. Or yep. my, so how how do you differentiate yep. the CQ test from or related to? Uh, should we forget about Myers-Briggs and and work styles, or you know how does it complement? How does it fit in with those other tests or that other that other analysis? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, next, no, <laughs> no, it's a, it's a good question, and I I would say um, all these diagnostic tools have certain value, but none of them gives us all the value. Um, so this is not a silver bullet. So if somebody's sitting here saying, you know what, I need to become more cultural intelligent, I'm going to take the test, and then I'm good, you know. That's not true of Myers-Briggs, that's not true of you know, Taylor Johnson or any of these diagnostic tests. They simply help you to see um, some, some elements that you may have missed in your life and, and are an interpretive grid from which you can go from there. So 
Um, I would say, you know, if, if you're saying should I do away with those other tests, absolutely not. I would say bring this into your arsenal um, and say we're going to use this particularly to diagnose where you stand <coughs> in terms of your own culture and how that fits in with cultures around the world. So a real practical use of this in, in the Christian mission world for me is uh, with cross-cultural missionary workers. So next month I'm going to do a very similar seminar at a missions agency and they all do the test before they come in. So I get the results of the test, I look at where they're at and then I talk to them about that. So that's very helpful because if somebody is going to um, Africa, somebody is going to um, let's say uh, pick a country in Africa, right? So they're going to Zimbabwe um, and when I get look at the results of the test, I see they're individualistic, they're low power distance, you know, they're just the extreme Anglo responses for just about everything. And I know that Zimbabwe, as I look at the test, I see that they're the opposite of that. That conversation with that individual is going to be very much geared around saying, there's something that needs to happen here, because you can grow in your CQ. So there's something that needs to happen here, because if you're going to be successful over there, something's got to change. <laughs> Right. You, and that something is you. <laughs> Zimbabwe is not going to change. You've got to change. So here's how we can help you do that. If on the other hand the test comes back and that person by some quirk uh, is exactly or fate or God's design, whatever you want to say, right? They happen to be very much like the typical Zimbabwean. Then that conversation with that person is like, you know what, I think this is a great move for you because you're going to go there and you're going to feel right at home. <laughs> you're going to feel like this is great. Um, several years ago there was a gentleman I met from South Carolina, um, wonderful accent, wonderful accent, Love, loved hearing him talk, I loved hearing him speak Zulu, you know, uh, he spoke Zulu just poetically, you know, Sal Bona, it was great. You know? um, now this guy, you look at him and he, he said he wants to go work with the Zulu people. Um, he grew up as a chicken farmer his whole life, very rural background. And on the first bit, you look at this guy and you say, you are so worlds apart, buddy, from, from the Zulu people. I mean, you don't, you, don't, you don't even know anyone of a different race group, let alone lived among them. But you know what the amazing thing is? He was perfect for that, for that culture. The people there love the guy. They love him. They treat him like one of their own. Why? Because in so many ways, he is like them. Everything but skin color and accent, he is like them. You know, they're rural, he's rural. They have a very similar mindset. They're very collectivistic. They just have a, so much in common that he has been an immense success in doing what he's doing. He's never taken a CQ diagnostic test, but I bet if he did, you would look at that and say, you are a perfect fit for this culture. So that's why I would say doing the, the test is helpful, but so is Myers-Briggs, and so is the other diagnostic tools too. So. Well, I, you know, I, I just say this and I'll stop the rest of the time. Yep. I, I do, um, as I listen to what you're saying over the, the sessions that we've been together, I'm thinking about applications of mm. this knowledge or this approach. And I'm thinking that student life needs to, to embrace this and to use it as a tool to facilitate better understandings, to de-emphasize, defuse racial kind of tensions that, that can and do happen on a campus like ours. Sure. Um, so if, if student life is using it, I'm thinking also of missions, um, mm. use short-term mission trips. And, sure. Um, we used to use the sure. bongo bongo, or that, that what's that, uh, that uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, it, there's a, a game that okay. you use to facilitate cultural awareness, understanding. Okay. Um, and then of course I'm just thinking about that in terms of application for our business students sure. um, across the board, really, um, as you so well documented, the multicultural mm -hmm. emphasis and awareness um, demands that, that we be aware of. But I'm also aware, too, that like, even the, the millennials uh, mm -hmm. function different. You know, they, they learn collectively, whereas we, we learn different. Our generation, Dan and my generation. <laughs> You've been fine with Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, um, so, I, you know, just yeah. Uh, yeah. becoming aware of many different applications that we could 
been mm -hmm. made this material? There are, there are many different applications. The generational one we haven't spoken about, but that is huge because you look at a lot of corporations today. You have the, the, the aging CEO, right? And then you have these bright young bucks coming in who know everything, right? So, so how does an how does organization like that navigate the future successfully? You know, there's a huge amount of CQ knowledge that needs to go into that. I'll just touch on the mission thing. Um, just not that what I'm doing is better than anything else, but what I do with my interns who I send overseas to do various assignments in between their junior and senior year, they take uh, what we call the T1, T2 test, which is basically they take the CQ diagnostic test before they go. I sit down and compare that with where they're going. And we meet for half an hour and I give them specific things that they can work on while they're away. So they go into the trip for the two months, three months that they're gone. They know where they're weak and they know where they're good. And they work at their weaknesses and they work out of their strengths. Then when they come back, about three to six months after they come back, they take the test again. Then we compare both of those results. And we look at it and say, okay, so how have you grown in your CQ score? So, how have you improved as a result of being away? And it's amazing, just that the few times that I've done it, that people come back and they're like, you know, because I was aware that I was weak here, I worked exceedingly hard to make sure that my knowledge grew or that I was more intrinsically interested or that my strategy was adjusted, all those things. And their score grew, you know, gee, who knew, <laughs> right? So that's kind of obvious that that would happen. But I don't think it would have happened if we would just say, hey, look at the CIA fact file, look at the cultural faux pas, don't do this, don't do that. Probably wouldn't have happened. So it's very helpful in that way. Yep. You had a question. Oh, okay. oh no, sorry. Oh, good. Yes, sir. Yeah, it seems to me what you brought here to the college when we need to hear about cultural <coughs> sensitivity and accepting other people's cultures is very important. And it's missing in a church. And corporate America is picking up on it, corporations around the world, because it does work. Mm, mm. But it seems to me, as I read history <clears throat> and the scripture, what you're hoping that comes into church today was part of the church mm. at one time, mm. in the first two or three centuries. Mm. I mean, even in the Roman Empire, Roman authority said, these Christians get along with everybody. They submit to everybody. It's like this earth isn't their home. They're looking someplace else. See, so what happened back then was the Christians knew that the nation they were living in wasn't it? It wasn't their nation. It was a the nation they lived in. Yeah. So, like for example, today you would hope this is what we should say: I'm living in America, but it's not my nation. It's the nation I live in. My citizenship is in heaven, who's builders, maker, and God. And you and I, I mean, you're, you're from South Africa, and I'm from America. We have more in common with each other because we're in a holy nation than with other unsaved Americans. Mm. So the Roman Constantine saw this too. He said, "Hey, I know how to save the Roman Empire. Christianity is going to be the glue to hold it all together because." These Christians aren't thinking about here. They, they have other ideas. And Paul, even Paul said, I'm a Jew to the Jews. I'm a Greek to the Greeks. He would pass your test. I'm a Greek to the Greeks. I'm a Jew to the Jews. <laughs> and I'm weak to the weak. I'm weak to, so we need to get back to all this. But then also, he would stood, what's his name, to his face. He said, Paul said, I would stood Peter to his face because he was to be blamed. So he spoke up too when he needed to. Mm -hmm. But all of this was part of the church at one time, but now it's out. Yeah. And we need to bring it back. And maybe this is what God's doing through you and other folks like this, we need to bring this back, mm. right? Because on the, on the stage, in some stages, there's the American flag and the Christian flag. Which one are we gonna embrace? If it's America, forget about it. Mm. It's gotta be the Christian flag. So this sensitivity, I think it was part of the church once it's gone, now it, does, now it needs to come back. Yeah, no, well said. Um, I, and I'd agree with that. And I do think we do have some models of that. And I, the problem is <laughs> um, they don't all fit what we think is legit as far as the church is concerned. And, and that sometimes is our problem. But could it be because people in the church around the world, America's first, then Christianity, or France is first, then Christianity, or Spain is first, then Christianity, where it should be Christianity first. Christians should be thinking about their heavenly citizenship, sure. not the country they live yeah. in. Mm -hmm. And then maybe if that if had that idea, might be better. No, I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Yeah, f for sure. Um, you know, it's about being kingdom people, and, mm -hmm. and we're yes. people of, of God's kingdom, and um, that is why, really, we come back to what we said before. You know, um, this picture of the church and Revelation, and the picture of 
of God's work amongst the nations to the Jew and to the Greek, you know, that was really racial divides. There was a lot of ethnic issues there. Um, and we see them worked out in the book of Acts. It wasn't all great. You know, there was uh, certainly some division there. Um, but there was, a, there was a great amount of dexterity within that to say, you know, we are, um, you know, Galatians talks about that. We are all one in Christ. There's neither male nor female, Jew or Greek, you know. So um, I think that was a great bridging divide between. Right. Some Americans are upset that all the Spanish immigrants are coming over. But now you, your trips can take money. You don't have to go on a mission field. Down. They're coming in. So learn Spanish and start talking to them. There's 51 million of them here. And counting. And the thing, too, is, is um, I, I think it's a great point. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a group going to India um, that I came across. And, um, you know, in, India is quite far away and it's quite expensive to get to. And I said, you know, what do you want, why do you want to go there? And they said, well, you know, we want to, we want to evangelize uh, Indians, you know, just have a great love for Indians, we want to evangelize Indians. I'm like, you should go to Dunkin' Donuts sometime, you know, <laughs> because there's plenty of Indians yeah. there and you should go get gas, you know, because there's plenty of Indians. So when you Probably do you that, need to first, then go over there. Exactly. They, they came from India here, they're on your doorstep and you're ignoring them and you're going back to India, you know, yes. so maybe somewhere along the line we need to start there. And that's not to say we shouldn't go to India, but if, you're, if you have a love for Indians, trust me, you don't have to go to India. Other questions? Um, so thinking like practically, on one of your slides it said like asking better questions is mm. kind of a high level maybe of this cultural intelligence. So maybe like practically in the church or like in the business field or education field, how could we, um, even as the younger generation, ask better questions um, to people or just be like, I guess more cultural sensitive to others? I think you're almost answering the question with your question because the fact that you're asking the question means that you're aware that you need to ask better questions. <laughs> Does that sound confusing? Um, it sounded confusing to me. So, no, but I, I, I think that that's what, that's what you're saying is, is the first step is being aware and to say, you know what, I need to notice, I need to take stock, I need to maybe step back a little bit and before I offer solutions, before I cr criticize, let me be uh, silent. Let me reflect. Um, Paul Hibbert has a great analogy for this. He talks about the insider and the outsider. Uh, the outsider is the tourist. The outsider is someone who goes to the country, they look at the way people dress, they say, oh, look at how they dress, look at the food, oh, look at what this and that. That's what a tourist does, right? They always look at things from the perspective of their own culture. They eat funny food, they dress in funny clothes. But an, out, an insider is somebody who's able to critique because they have been able to work inside that culture and appreciate it for what it is, then they have the authority to speak into that culture. So it's not to say, oh, you must just appreciate everything about the culture. I had this conversation with, with some students online about this, uh, talking about different, you know, in South Africa there's a lot of different cultures, so there's often <coughs> clashes between those cultures. Um, so you have, I'll give you one example, you have one culture group, their uh, part of their ritual, their culture, their custom, is when there's a wedding and there's a funeral, you bring a live goat to the house and you slaughter that goat um, in the yard. Then you have a bunch of other people who are very Western. <laughs> They're like, that's animal cruelty. We're going to call, you know, the, 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 the food, uh, the, the food, uh, goats are food, but, um, you know, call, call the Animal Protection Society and whatever. We're going to have you guys arrested for doing this in suburban areas. And so there's, wow, there's a culture clash right there. So can we take a step back, look at that and say, well, what's really going on here? And I think you can only do that, as Paul did at Moss Hill, when he learned and understood the culture. And then when he stood up to speak, what he spoke was the gospel, but he spoke it in terms that people were ready to listen. By the time he said, what you worship is unknown, I'm going to reveal to you as a note. He can only say what you worship is unknown because he'd done his research and he knew that that was the case and he knew their poets, and he knew their stories, and he could speak into it meaningfully. So I think the first step is saying, I need to ask better questions, and then go from there, read, research. Good. Anything else? Yeah. Okay, so like, say you're, if you're moving to a, going to a new country, different country, and you take this test and you see that, you know, like you're very Western because you grew up there, and then you're like moving to the country. I'm moving to Japan, so I'm trying to, Start getting that figured out. Like with this test, if you see that your scores are, or your ideas are different from their culture, is it more about like trying to assimilate and become more like if they're more culturalistic or just learning how to more work with people? Um, like 
yeah. I, th I don't yeah. know if that makes sense. But. Yeah, so there's a degree at which we can do things in a patronizing way. And, um, you know, one of, the, one of the questions that sometimes gets asked by, by the business world um, is how genuine do I have to be? You know, so when a Japanese businessman hands me his business card, which is seen as a very important token for us, a business card is like, yeah, whatever, you know, tuck it in my wallet. You don't do that in Japan because it's a very important thing that they're giving you. Show honor and respect in receiving that and holding on to it. Okay, so that's just a small thing. So they would look at that and say, okay, I'll do that. Whatever. Yeah, this is a great business card. Thanks a lot. Now, are you willing to sign the deal? You know, so. They ask the question sometimes of, you know, do I just need to do this to, you know, get this guy to sign on the dotted line and how much of this needs to be me? Mm. And for me, I think, well, you know, depends how deceptive you want to be. But um, for us as Christians, I think we want to get to the point where we are genuinely interested. If, we, if you want to move to Japan, why do you want to move to Japan? Like, <laughs> you know, why do you want to go there? If you don't want to go there to become part of those people, then my, my honest uh, suggestion to you would be don't go, right. really, because um, Japan is full of Japanese people, <laughs> okay? So they act and live in a certain way, and if you don't want to act and live in that way, then don't go there. Um, and so the more in which you're willing to, to engage with that and to live that lifestyle and to, and to be like that, the more in which you'll gain respect from them, first of all, and the more in which you'll begin to appreciate both the, the, the good and the bad in your own culture and the good and bad in this and speak meaningfully to it. Does that make sense? Dr. Duncan? Yeah, I, I particularly like your, your ideas here of a cultural culture. Uh, and I think it's something that would be very helpful to integrate into our, our business program because it is, it's an awareness and it's a sensitivity. Yeah. But as I sit here and, and as we talked earlier, you, you know I born in Canada, lived there for most of my life, I've been here 25 years, but mm. when, you, when you talk about Western approaches, um, I, I would say American is different than Canadian. I think we tend to be much more of a collectivist kind of mm. uh, thinking society, and it's a, it's a different <laughs> perspective yeah. out there. And, and I know when I first came down, it was very foreign to me to kind of operate in this culture that it was very individualistic, where people would tend to take advantage of you if you didn't fight back. The problem is I learned how to do that. Now when I go back home to Canada, I don't really fit in when I try to negotiate things that well. So I, I think there's a sensitivity both ways, and, and I think it's a yes. great thing that you could integrate. Yes. You know, that's a very important point because at what point do you cease to become true to yourself? How do you stay true to who you are as a person and yet become extremely adept at dealing with different cultures? That is a great question. Well, maybe the answer is the goal. See, Paul said he was a Jew to the Jew, a Greek to the Greeks, and we to the we, to win them to who? Christ. Mm -hmm. So the goal maybe will help. What's the goal? You know, to be successful? Well, as a Christian, we want to win others to the Lord. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So we're willing to do that for Christ's sake. Yeah, no, for sure. But, but he was still Paul, though. Like, he didn't, he didn't cease to become who he was. And that's, that's sometimes a conundrum, yeah. is uh, you can lose the sense of who you are if you, uh, if you just abandon that. So, yeah. Yeah, Missy? This is almost more of a um, comment or observation. I wanted to see if you agree with it. But I teach interpersonal communication, and my secular interpersonal communication textbook is focused on being others-oriented. So whether we're talking about culture, or we're talking about conflict, or we're talking about differences in perception, or we're talking about differences in gender, the focus is on getting out of your own perspective and trying to view things from other people's perspectives, which to me is a very biblical concept. We have love your neighbor as yourself, value others more highly than you value yourself, and it seems to me that's the basic idea behind cultural intelligence, too, is you're trying to basically get yourself out of, while you acknowledge your own perspective, you're trying to get yourself out of your own perspective to see things from other people's, to view things from their, their side, to accept life as they do. And it seems like that's a value we should all want because it helps us in all parts of life. It helps us in conflict. It helps us in all of our relationships to make them all better. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. Um, you know, uh, Stephen Covey, 
Christian, right? <laughs> Um, in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, one of those seven habits is seek first to understand rather than be understood. Um, and I, I think that speaks to the otherness, you know, looking at where is somebody else coming from. Um, so if we truly want to communicate with somebody, um, I think the focus needs to be on how can I make sure that their message is understood rather than how can I make sure that they hear what I'm saying, you know, um, like if you know what I mean, the difference there. So, I would agree, yeah, broadly. Dr. Dr. Henry, yeah. What, what would you say to this question? There, a person is young and he acknowledges all this, the velocity of what you're saying. And then he becomes highly successful and he ages several decades and the world is changing, but what has worked for him has worked so well that he asks the inevitable question, why do I need to change and why does my organization need to change? How does a person act proactively so as to remain culturally flexible as he ages? Um, <laughs> hypothetically speaking, um, well, from what you've seen or yeah. maybe from what you've read or experienced. I mean, not, not experienced directly, but sure. seen in the lives of other people who are affected with this. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a layered question, really, I think, in a lot of ways, because it obviously depends on the individual and depends on the industry and a whole lot of factors. Um, but I think if, if one wants to remain relevant in society, because society is shifting, and even more so now, I mean, if you think of five years ago, people were wondering what this new thing called the iPad was. That's just five years ago, right? So technology is changing, it's changing the way in which we live. So how much is that gonna be 10 years time? What are we gonna be using then? So I think generally speaking, if somebody wants to stay ahead for whatever reason, that's a good, that's a good reason to understand the culture and surroundings of which you're in. Um, but I think um, for uh, for a Christian, we've kind of mentioned a lot of those reasons. So if the person's thinking, you know, from a Christian perspective, they truly want to appreciate some of that. Uh, for me, you know, the people that I have most admired uh, have been those people that have been willing to acknowledge their mistakes and have been willing to make the necessary reparation to be able to move on successfully. Um, so regardless of how successful you are, you've made mistakes, you know, you've done things. I mean, you look at Steve Jobs, everyone say, wow, you know, he was so successful. And you kind of read his story and you speak to some of the former employees, it wasn't really such a nice guy a lot of the time, you know, so he made some significant errors. Um, and I think that same is true in many different organizations and, and spheres. So, um, you know, I've, I've found, especially cross-cultural workers, um, over time they tend to become at times a, a little bit battle-hardened. Um, to the point that they don't really accept critique that well and they don't really want to be criticized because they feel like they have you know they've, they've made this this great uh, um, impact um, but those that have gone look back and said you know what one friend of mine recently who, who uh, worked as a missionary for 26 years um, he recently said to me you know what when we first got over there we made the mistake of thinking we were the only expression of the church that was there. Because we were independent fundamentalists, you know, we were the only people who knew what was truth. And so, it didn't matter who else came along and said that they were Christians, we just discounted them. And, you know, he came out of a fundamentalist kind of background. And he acknowledged that. He said, no, that was a grave mistake. And I publicly apologize to those people. And I want to make reparation for that. And I think that's huge. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question really, but I think you know the ability to acknowledge your blind spots and your willingness to realize that because world is changing, you need to stay ahead of the game. Those are probably two things I would say that helps. You're very helpful. Well, thank you everybody for your participation for sure. It's been a good evening. Um, Dr. Clem, would you pray for us? Sure. As we go. Thank you, Gerald, for your with us over the last few days. Pleasure. Very helpful. Yeah. Father, we thank you so much for this time. Thank you for your servant who has come to labor among us and to give himself to us and to serve us 
with this skill set and this knowledge and this um, interest that he has. And, and uh, Lord, we see so many wonderful applications of it. And we just thank you for him. Pray for his family that he's been apart from over these few days. Just give them the strength and the grace and the peace and uh, the settlement of heart that they need. And uh, reunite them tomorrow as they uh, are able to embrace each other. And so, Father, Father, we thank you so much for all of this. Thank you for our dear friends who are here in the room who have come to participate in this conversation tonight. And Lord, help us to be able to process this uh, accurately and to make good use of it uh, now that we've been informed and now that we're now stewards of this information. So we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.